Oh, I think only systems that generate this reality space construct have a capacity to support a meaningful version of awareness and a subjective character to experience. I wouldn't go so far as needing to extend that to something like the nematode C. elegans. Given the question earlier, I wouldn't go so far as to extend it to something like a box jellyfish. Now, that's not to say that the C. elegans doesn't have a nervous system. It has a nervous system. It's centralized. It's integrated. There is interaction of sensory information in the nematode nervous system. But what's lacking is there is no capacity for the nematode to relate its senses. And there is really no capacity for much subjective processing in the nematode. So the nematode has no spatial sense, no temporal sense. Without that binding, unifying relation between sensory information, I think it's really hard for the nematode to create any sort of unified percept. I don't think a nematode can support either a meaningful version of experience, nor can it actually be in any sense a meaningful subject. And with lacking both of those, I think it's a moot point to ask whether there's any subjective aspect to a nematode's experience, given I don't think it has the capacity to support experience. So I'm going to wrap up there. To summarize my argument, what I've done is I've proposed a model for how the insect brain works as a behavioral control system. It does that by creating a reality space for the bee that, that, that basically is a neural model of the mobile bee in space weighted by the needs and subjective state of the bee. Um, I think that's a really close functional analogy between the kinds of processing that are happening certainly in primitive vertebrates. And for that reason, I think it is a reasonable argument to propose that we could extend a basic assumption of awareness to organisms like a bee. And thanks very much. So I'm just interested. Thank you for a really beautiful... Thank you for a really beautiful uh, presentation. I'm really interested in something you said at the end about this... Um, necessary condition of unified subjectivity, and I really wondered if you could say a little bit more about that. It seems that that's a condition that you haven't, that you just sort of threw in, and it seems that um, a, if that's what's necessary, I think more argument is needed. So I wonder if you could say more about that. So what I meant by that is I think that this sense of perceptual unity is such a strong part of our experiential world that if you're lacking that, whether there can be any meaningful subjectivity to senses in isolation is a question that I'm struggling with. I think it's, the, it's when senses fall into a relation with each other that that's when we get this sense of a unified percept. And I think that that's when it's moot to talk about basically being a subject and to also have a subjective character to the experience. And so I, I was reaching for a water bottle. I can't see you ask the question, so I'm sort of flapping my eye gaze across the room in a really vague way. Ah, there you are. Thank you. Good. Hello. Sorry. Yep. Um, so you, you gave a, a, a list of your uh, criteria for bees. So the thing that I wonder about your talk, actually the previous two talks as well, is that for many of those things, um, we, we know that humans can do them unconsciously. Uh, for example, we have unconscious attention. We have unconscious multisensory integration. Uh, so I wonder, in fact, I believe probably it's true for every single thing on your list that they can be done unconsciously. So how can we conclude from those items that insects are conscious? So let me clarify, that's not my list of criteria for consciousness in insects. That list included purely to break the myth that an insect is an instinct-driven organism with no behavioral capacity. Within my lifetime as a researcher, we, it, it's still very much the case I go to conferences and people ask me the question, does a bee have a brain? People are still driven by textbooks saying that insects cannot learn, um, whereas what we're learning is actually a great deal about the behavioral capacity of an organism. So no, I don't think any of those are necessary or requirements for consciousness in insects. They simply illustrate the, rel they simply illustrate the behavioral capacities of the organism that we're dealing with. But you didn't really answer the main question. No, but I think which I is, did clarify a point. But you the, did. You did. But, but the, look, main the main question, question is, yeah. if we're... I am. <laughs> trying. The main I'm question is... Yeah, go on. The main question is, if we're going to find characteristics of insects that we think 
may be sufficient for them to have consciousness, that's a, there's a big problem if those can be done unconsciously in humans. So I'm now going to answer your question, Ned. I'm going to try to. So I think that what we're looking at is, is actually a point that has been raised by the two previous speakers, which is the different levels of consciousness. So we can talk about, when we talk about a human being unconscious, we're talking about basically lesioning a degree of self-awareness, but have we actually lesioned the awareness of the human in order for them to carry out? When we talk about a human being unconscious, we're talking about basically lesioning a degree of self-awareness, but have we actually lesioned the awareness of the human in order for them to carry out of the human in order for them to carry out the kind of things on that list? The only level of consciousness that I'm, I'm, I'm dragging down to an insect is a basic awareness of its environment rather than no awareness at all. I think <clears throat> we're all uh, like the drunk and the lamppost. M uh, myself included, I thought I stood up quite well. <laughs> myself included. Okay. Uh, we're looking for the origin of X. And we use all these weasel words for X, like consciousness, awareness, self-awareness, agency, qualia. We add functional criteria like integration, etc. It allows us to deny that a, an amphioxus is conscious because we've used another word for consciousness. Even Tom Nagel, in, in his very catchy title, left out what would have prevented all this weaseling. Instead of calling his article, what is it like to be a bat? If he had said, what does it feel like to be a bat? We'd know what it is that we were shooting for and what we're denying Amphioxus if we pinch him and all he feels is ouch and either runs or stays and yet he feels it. That's the problem explaining that. The rest is just picking our favorite correlate for the presence of that. So I'm not <laughs> clear what the question is. So you're saying the only thing that would matter would be an aversive response to pain? The only thing that matters for consciousness is sentience, and sentience is feeling something, anything. But haven't you just contradicted yourself? Because if what you're feeling is not ouch, are you still sentient? If you're feeling something, you're sentient. If you're feeling nothing, you're not sentient. So integrating the model that, I've, that I put forward and that Bjorn proposed, Exactly integrated in that is this, and I mean, we talk about it in terms of motivation, needs of the organism, but it's that subjective state of self. So that's certainly part of the argument that I've proposed. Weasel word. We'll disagree on whether it's a weasel word or useful or not. <laughs> okay, uh, one more from Duncan. So you, you've pushed back against the idea that insects are, are, are little robots that have rigid behavior. Um, but there are, I mean, obviously there are many kinds of insects, um, and I'm wondering where you apply this, um, and as a fellow Australian, I'm concerned about ants, as you would understand. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I've been told, for example, that, that uh, in some species of ant, when an ant dies, the workers remove the body from the hive, uh, or the colony, but in fact, if you put a drop of uh, oleic acid, I think it is, on the body of a living ant, the worker ants will drag it out as if it were dead, even though it's wriggling and resisting. Um, that doesn't sound to me like they have much awareness. That sounds more like you've got a, an algorithm that hasn't quite got all the subtlety that it should have. Um, okay, so that's a bit of an, so that, that's a slight, okay, so th the complex, so first of all, that's a bit of an unfair stereotype of a lot of ants. Okay. <laughs> Good, and I'm, I'll accept that. I'm, I'm very fond of a lot of ants and have deep personal relationships with a lot of ants. But the, the, the more nuanced answer is that what we developed in detail in the paper that Colin and I put forward is the distinction between content and capacity. So I'm talking about a capacity for any sort of awareness at all. The content, the kind of awareness, will vary enormously between species depending on what their sensory systems are and the kind of world they live in and their niche and their structures. For the ants that you're talking about, for the ones where that will work, which is a minority of ants who are a bit dumb, 
then we're talking about the ants that are extremely olfactory driven with almost no sense of vision. And in those situations, yes, they will be overwhelmingly driven by an olfactory pheromone like that. It actually is adaptive for anything that even smells a bit dead to get rid of it because of the danger of infecting the colony. So if you're unsure, assume it's dead from an ant's point of view and get it out the hive. Nest, ant, sorry. Okay, our final speaker is Ava Jablonka from Tel Aviv University. Uh, Ava is a theoretical biologist who's uh, appointed in the, uh, the Cohn Institute for the History and Philosophy of Science and Ideas in, uh, in Tel Aviv. Very well known for her work on a broad scope uh, model of evolutionary theory. Uh, the book Evolution in Four Dimensions has been especially uh, influential. In recent years, he's gotten very interested in consciousness, and the talk today will be on consciousness as we know it, the role of learning. So please welcome Eva Jablonka. Uh, right. uh, thank you very much, and uh, it's a really thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to present a uh, slightly different uh, perspective on uh, consciousness, which is uh, basically an evolutionary perspective, an evolutionary transition perspective. Not just based on comparative studies, also on comparative studies, but on a general broad concept of what a uh, an evolutionary, or major evolutionary transition of the kind of the transition to consciousness may mean and how we could study it. So first of all, I want to make clear what I'm talking about and what are the concepts that I'm using. So I'm going to talk about minimal consciousness and this for me is the same as sentience and this is the same as subjective experiencing. This is the most basic, non-reflective, subjective feeling that includes extraroceptive, visual, olfactory, interoceptive, pain, hunger, thirst, and proprioceptive bodily position, for example, experiences. And what we suggest, and when I'm saying we, I'm talking about this work has not only been done by myself, it's done with Simona Ginsburg and Zohar Bronfman, uh, with whom we've been working for quite a long time. And uh, what, what, what uh, our basic uh, view, uh, our basic concept of, what, uh, uh, of how we should look at consciousness is we want to look at it, we look at it as a dynamical, intrinsically teleological system something which is more or less equivalent to Aristotle's sensitive soul. This is also the <laughs> title of the book that I'm writing with Simona Gunzburg, The Evolution of the Sensitive Soul. <laughs> uh, so, and what we're using is an evolutionary transition approach. We say, uh, when we're thinking about it, we, we, we think about that there were three major kind of teleological, intrinsically teleological transitions in evolution the transition to life, to consciousness, and to rationality. And we use the transition to living entities as a guiding heuristics. We think that when people have started thinking about the transition to life in an evolutionary context, a lot of the problems and a lot of the pseudo-problems that existed when people were trying to figure out what exactly life is and what are the boundaries of life versus non-life and so on and so forth, dissolved. And we hope that by using a kind of similar strategy, we will manage to dissolve some of the problems of uh, what consciousness is. Although we are, not, we are not trying to say that there is no such thing as consciousness in the same way, of course, that we are not trying to say that there is no such thing as life. Of course there is. And uh, the, the point of this uh, talk is that we're going to uh, have a specific uh, kind of proposal, and that is that the evolution of learning drove the evolution of minimal consciousness. That this was the evolutionary driver of uh, minimal consciousness in the sense that I defined it. So we're using the heuristics of the of the, li of the origin of life project, evolutionary origin of life project. How did people go about it? 
What I'm, t uh, what I'm describing now is, of course, some kind of idealization because people didn't go in exactly this way about it. They, they went in all kinds of directions at the same time. Nevertheless, for didactic reasons, it's a good idea to, to do this. And what I'm, we're, we're, you list the necessary and sufficient characteristics of the object of study, for example, of what a living organism is. Okay, there'll be lots of people who think differently about these things. But what is interesting about li uh, when we are looking at the list that people have prepared is that there is a lot of overlap between them, a lot, a lot of overlap. Although, of course, some people think it's metabolism first, some people think it's replication first, it doesn't matter. When you put it all together, you see there is a huge overlap. Excuse me, this always happens. <laughs> right. The second thing is to suggest something that I will go that I will go into quite a lot, uh, not a lot, a little <laughs> here, and that is a transition marker. Some capacity of the system, th uh, that, or a property of the system, that requires that for this capacity to exist, there must be an encompassing, enabling system that fa satisfies the criteria, all the criteria for, uh, for the system, for life or for consciousness. Then, if we are lucky, we can, uh, if, if, if we can, is to construct a toy model that spells out the dynamic organization that can instantiate such a system from the capacity, from the marker, evolutionary marker. Then point to evolutionary scenario, to the when, where, and how did such a process happen, and how it reframes philosophical questions. Once we agree, if, if we agree, <laughs> that this is a valid project. Okay, so let's have a look at the transition for life, at, at the marker for the transition of life. And here I'm building on the work of Tibor Ganti, Hungarian, uh, a Hungarian uh, chemist, a theoretical chemist, and on uh, the work of uh, Ers uh, Maynard Smith, John Maynard Smith and Ers Satmari on their, wor on the, on their analysis of life in, in their book, The Major Transitions in Evolution. And what they did there, I will not go into the many things they did in this book, but when they were talking in this book, but when they were talking about life, and when they, are, they defined a capacity, and it was the capacity for unlimited heredity, as the capacity that once it exists in a chemical system, will make this system a, a system of sustainable life. It's an important point. It is a system of sustainable life because maybe there are all kinds. We are not going into a lot of definitions here because you know there are gray areas which we really cannot define in uh, in evolutionary biology. It's 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 a it's a characteristic of any evolutionary thinking. It's not a bug. It's a feature. And so, but once you have this uh, capacity, then you know yes. There is here a system of sustainable life. And what they suggested was that the marker, the evolutionary marker for sustainable life is unlimited heredity. And that is the, a system where the number of hereditary variations is practically, practically unlimited. Of course, mathematically it is limited, but practically unlimited and evolution is therefore open-ended. And this contrasts with the system of limited heredity, where you have a s relatively small number of variants that are possible. And of course, the number of variants that are possible is smaller than the environments, and therefore it's not a, it's not a sustainable system, because it, sooner or later, environment will come that will destroy the system. And it does not have the capacity to respond to it. So unlimited heredity is their marker. And, what, and when you are trying to analyze what kind of system can enable a system, can be an enabling system for unlimited heredity, you come very interestingly with something like quite a complex autopoietic system. Not quite like a cell, but not that far from it. So, this is, and unlimited heredity, they claim, is a good marker for a transition to sustainable life. And I think this is a very important and valid point. So can we point out to something that is a similar marker for consciousness? And can we then use it in order to reverse engineer the enabling system? It's a very big project, of course, 
I'm not claiming we did it, but we are starting. We think it's a good way of starting working on it. So let's start with the list. We went through hundreds of lists of, of, by philosophers and by neurobiologists and cognitive biologists who gave us characteristics of consciousness without sort of circularity, without saying, ah, this is subjectivity. Well, if it's subjectivity, that's the end of the story, right? But all kinds of capacities that, they, that people believe are joint, are, uh, are, uh, are individually necessary and jointly sufficient to describe something like uh, uh, a system that when it has all these capacities, all of them, it can be said, well, it is a very likely thing that this is a conscious system. So we're talking about flexible, flexible values so that valence can be attributed to many, many different things, positive or negative. We're talking about unity and diversity through all kinds of sensory binding. So we don't see just a, we, we see the apple as green and round and, we, and it has a center all at the same time. And each of these things separately it is, uh, we can react to them very, very differently if they are separate from the whole. There is global avail availability of information involving uh, multidirectional feedback and reentrant interactions, implying causal efficacy of mental states. I will not go into it, it's a big argument. There is temporal thick, but global availability means that a lot of different modalities can interact. There is a kind of global, uh, not, uh, not uh, and there is a kind of image, not only of the world, but of the body in the world and of the individual as an active agent acting with the body, acting in the world. We're talk uh, people are talking about temporal thick thick uh, thickness, about sensory temporal persistence, about selection. The selection principle is enormously important. This, the idea that exploration and selective stabilization at different levels are absolutely crucial to our understanding of what, uh, what, uh, uh, what processes that are underlying consciousness are is very, very widespread. And the idea is that this kind of selective stabilization leads through inhibitions to serial information processing and includes processes of selective attention. We're talking about intentionality, aboutness, and here I will just put the simplest and common sense way of thinking about it, simply mapping. Mapping of the body, mapping of the world in a distal systems, a system. And we're talking about embodiment, agency, and self. The integration of the, ins uh, the, the there is no conscious organism that is not, doesn't have a body. I'm talking about consciousness as we know it. I'm not talking about consciousness of computers. I'm not talking about robots. I'm talking about consciousness as we know it, the only consciousness that we are aware of. And this is what I want to understand. So this, uh, we're talking about embodiment, about agency, and about self, absolutely crucial notions for, uh, uh, for, for people who are doing consciousness studies. The organism, one, must distinguish itself from the world, and it does. And again here we come to the kind of ideas that Bjorn Merker has been talking about, about reafference as an absolutely crucial aspect of, and as I will argue, quite, quite complex reafference, not any reafference, not peripheral reafference, but central reafference is very, very important for uh, an organism that we can define, that we can attribute consciousness to. Now, so we were looking for all, for, for what is it that ca we can use as a marker? Some capacity that will be general enough, not specific to, uh, to insects, not specific to, uh, to cephalopods, not specific to vertebrates, something general that when we find it, we can say, well, there is a good chance that this is a, a conscious, that the system enabling this, not the actual capacity, of course, is conscious. And we have been rather influenced by uh, Miner Smith and Satmari and Ganti. And, we, and after we looked for a year for all kinds of markers from the molecular to the neurobiological, we didn't know what we were looking for. And in the end, sort of for us, the penny dropped. And we uh, defined something that we call unlimited associative learning. It's a specific form of classical and operant associative learning that satisfies 
several conditions. It's not simple associative learning. It has to satisfy the following three conditions, which are not enormously complicated, but in fact they are. Once you look at them, you see that the enabling system has to be bloody complex. So the first one is that the conditional stimulus or the behavior, the pattern of, behavior, the pattern of action is compound. That it, it consists of several fused features, color, shape, texture, and or patterns of action that are learned as a conjunction rather than separately. It's not one plus one plus one plus one. It's all together. The totality of this thing is different from the sum of its parts. Different, not greater or smaller, different. And it is novel. It is neither reflex eliciting nor, nor pre-associated through learning with an unconditional stimulus, unconditioned stimulus, and with a reinforcement, or with a reinforce, uh, reinforcing through previous learning. So it's neither kind of innate, nor is it already have been already learned. And the third is that the learned CS, the learned conditional stimulus, or the learned sequence of actions can subsequently support second order conditioning, acting itself as a US or reinforcement. Okay, so there is a, sub, uh, a, second, uh, a second order learning. That's all. Now, and then we ask the question, okay, first of all, why did we feel that it's a good one? It's not just an intuition based on unlimited heredity. It's because the number of associations that can be learned by an animal that can learn in this way and is huge. It's much, much greater than anything that can, that, than the number of environments that it can meet. So we have here not unlimited, not unlimited open-ended evolution, but the kind of open-ended ontogeny, ontogenetic learning. Now, then we ask ourselves, okay, let's say we have such a system. What does it entail? What do we need to have in order for such system to exist in the first place in an animal? What kind, what kind of nervous system do we need and so on and so forth? By the way, we believe that only central nervous system can work. So there must be mechanisms, first of all, that integrate the various uh, underlying features of whatever it is that is represented to form a compound, a com a, a a composite, and that the encoding must be multi-stage, hierarchical and predictive. We do believe that predictive coding is enormously important. We think that there is both top-down and bottom-up flow of information. We know that there is, and we have been very impressed. I know that there are many different opinions, uh, probably here as well as elsewhere, but we have been very, very impressed by the work of Carl Friston and his colleagues and uh, Andy Clark and Howie in Australia. We, uh, we think this kind of framework is very, very useful. There must be a dedicated memory system, that's the second thing, that, m that enables subsequent retrieval based on the learned compound patterns. So it's not just a local kind of memory. We have to have some kind of dedicated memory system that can store a lot, a lot of composites of different types. And the evaluation system must be able to assign balance to any compound uh, input. Now, I have here a t a very, very simple t uh, toy models for uh, what we called world learning and self-learning and then compound. The only thing to see, to, 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 to take home from these models, I can explain them, but we have no time, and this is a toy model of a toy model. Yes, we, we have the, I have the original toy model if somebody wants to, ha to have a headache. Uh, so, so what we need to have is a, is a sensor, uh, is, is a, the, our sensory units, integrating sensory units. We have to have motor integrating units. The sensory units take extraceptive, interoceptive, proprioceptive information. The motor units, the, uh, the motor units unite this proprioceptive and interoceptive information and, and, uh, and model the action of the animal in the world. We, we have to have value systems that are not inherent in a particular stimulus, but th they can be applied to any set of stimuli. And we, ha and we have to have association units that associate between the motor units that are uh, the, the high-level motor units that are integrating the information 
from the, uh, from, uh, from the body, from the action, and from the body and the world, and we have to have a, 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 a memory store unit, which, which is dedicated. And the arrows here say that between each of these, there are several hierarchical levels. And this is a very, very simple model of, a, of associative learning. We have a, this is a model of self-learning, when you learn about the self. This is a model about both. And the point is that when you are looking at, uh, when you are going back to the list and you are looking at what is required from UAL, what you see is that it satisfies all the set of criteria. All the set of criteria have to be satisfied for something like that to work at all. Again, I will not go into it for three, uh, two, uh, two and a half minutes of time. Now, the point is that if we are looking, and then we said, okay, so who has it? Who, ha who, who is learning by UAL in the animal world? And what we see is that there are three groups of animals that we can see. Some arthropods, most vertebrates, and some mollusks. The cephalopod mollusk, surprise, surprise. And, the, and the, we know that the arthropods and the vertebrates that seem to have it evolved in the Cumbrian, and uh, the, uh, the cephalopods, uh, the colloid cephalopods, uh, evolved uh, 300 million years later. Now here it is. This is a kind of summary, and what we see here are the 36 file of animals. According, I mean, some people say 34, some people say 36, never mind. We, we took the, uh, a very influential and good tree, we think. And what we see is all this, uh, those that don't have circles don't have a brain. Again, what is a brain, what is not a brain, is a very, very difficult thing to define. But according to most criteria, they don't have a brain. Those with a circle do have a brain. Those with a circle which has gray in it can learn by association, but not open-ended. Only those with the rays can learn uh, uh, by UEL. Now, we also argue that the evolution of associative learning, rather than any kind of particular sensory capacity, has been the, uh, has been the driving force of the Cumbrian explosion. It is behind, uh, it's mainly the arthropods. We believe that it started with the arthropods very, very quickly. The vertebrates evolved it in parallel, we think, although there are huge, analog uh, I don't know, analogies between the, the vertebrate brain and the insect brain. So we're not sure it's really total analogy, but, uh, but there may be a common, some kind of organization in the common ancestor. And we think that it uh, uh, led to a lot of uh, uh, arms races, and these arms races led to the incredible diversity that we see in the Cumbrian. So we generalized the kind of ideas that it was site that drove the Cumbrian explosion, or all kinds of other ideas that maybe the olfactory, uh, the evolution of olfactory sensors, and so on. Now, I don't have time. I don't think I have time to go into it. I just these are very common. Uh, people very commonly say, "Well, do you have to have UAL in order to be conscious?" Now, of course not. A baby is conscious, and it doesn't learn by un unlimited associative learning. The UAL is a positive marker of animal consciousness. Its present tells us that an animal is endowed with minimal consciousness, but its absence cannot determine whether or not an animal is not conscious. And we have to remember that a human that doesn't have a, a, the, 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 a baby or a person who has severe brain damage who cannot learn by, by UAL nevertheless experiences and we have to remember that the enabling system of UAL is in place even in incapacitated or ontogenetically very immature individuals. So this is in place. It is the enabling system that allows consciousness. And we have to remember that, and the example is that, you know, we have, if a cell is alive, a cell is alive even after you take its nucleus out. For example, erythrocytes, they live for 120 days. They don't divide, but they live. They metabolize and so on. So, uh, so they don't have an unlimited heredity system. They don't have a nucleus, right? But nevertheless, they live. Evolutionarily, of course, and developmentally, it's a dead end. We also believe that if an animal has lost its UAL capacity, which we believe happens several times in evolution, it will eventually also lose consciousness. 
So I think that consciousness is losable, like everything else in this world. Okay, now I want to finish with James, inevitably. And James, when he was thinking about consciousness, he said, consciousness is a fighter for ends, of which many, but for its presence, would not be ends at all. And we argue that it is a mistake to think about the functions of consciousness. For life doesn't have a function, life, life has a goal. There are many, many capacities of a living system that do have co functions, but life itself doesn't have a function. In the same way we think, consciousness doesn't have really a function. Yes, of course, it cannot contradict uh, uh, survival and reproduction, <laughs> right? But that's trivial. It is a system of goals, and the, we, we, and the emergence of consciousness led to the generation of a new functional realm. Thank you very much. Uh, so so I, at one point you um, sort of tabled the thought of what about uh, sort of computational or, or sort of computer-based systems, uh, but sort of thinking about unlimited associative learning, I think of the advances in machine learning and wonder if you have any thoughts about um, their uh, uh, sort of conscious properties and, and perhaps uh, the enabling systems that may or may not be present in those, in those software. Yes. Uh, we have thought about it, obviously. It's in, impossible not to think about it with, in, with this subject. And what I can tell you is this. Think about a system that, uh, that uh, uses an unlimited heredity system. For example, uh, a genetic algorithm implemented in a chip, in a computer chip. You will not say that the chip is alive because it implements an unlimited heredity system, right? So the implementation here is enormous. So there's something about the implementation here that is very, very important. Although you maybe you can say, well, if I find something like that, maybe I can deduce that somebody intelligent and alive did it. <laughs> but that's a different matter. That's a very, very different. So, okay, so that's the first thing. Now, when we're thinking about robots and about, uh, w we did a big, big survey also on uh, deep learning and things like that to see what has been achieved, what has not been achieved. And, uh, you know, there was this recent paper by Dehan in Science where they sort of also did uh, a survey which is very similar to what we did. There are beginnings of domain general uh, associative learning, really a domain general, without millions and millions and millions of trials. And uh, something, but, but basically, yes, I believe that there will be robots or machines that will implement unlimited associative learning. They will, not they will not be conscious for the same reason that the computer chip is not alive. Nevertheless, if you ask me if I think that if we will be able to, to have a conscious robots, I, my, my gut feeling is yes. I think it will be a much more complex system than the one that we, a, 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 that we think about. I think the analogies with life will go very much further. There is, as you probably know, developmental robotics. Uh, people are doing developmental robotics and getting very interesting results where the robots develop. Now, they develop only, only cognitively. They don't develop morphologically. Shall we need morphological development as well in order for the body to change and to learn through body changes? Possibly, you know, I, I think also our way of thinking about memory, we're thinking about synaptic memory, Hebbian kind of, of networks. I don't think it's enough. We know today that there is a hell of a lot of epigenetic systems that store memory at the level of chromatin structures. And we know that little RNAs can migrate between cells and can, le and can, and can take information from one level to another level. I think we are thinking about memory in a very primitive way today. And when, but we, we, we'll get there one day, right? We'll, we'll, we are improving all the time. So I think that when we, we, we shall have to learn more from biology. I, don't, I think that there are not that many shortcuts, as many as we think, to robots. But maybe I'm wrong. Okay, uh, let's take one more and get the, uh, get the 
panel on stage two, uh, Johan. Um, and in the meantime, why don't we get the other panelists? Um, uh, yes, both you and the previous speaker emphasized the importance of uh, the ability to learn and have flexible um, behavior to have consciousness. But Can you please repeat it? So, sorry. Yeah, yes, both you and the previous speaker emphasized the um, ability to have flexible behavior and learning to, as a sign of consciousness. But uh, isn't it a paradox that some of our strongest feelings uh, of uh, thirst, pain, etc., are instinctive and not learned behaviors. They are uh, unconditioned uh, stimuli. Yeah. And they, they give rise to very strong uh, okay. conscious feelings that are not learned. You are absolutely right. And this was also a point that was made by Denton mm. when he was talking about the imperative power yeah. of, <laughs> of, uh, of the primordial emotions. But the question is, where did it come from? Where did this very strong feelings come from? And we argue that it comes from the evolution of learning. So that this mm. is where it comes from. Yeah, yeah. We don't say that you, once, you have, once you have evolved the systems, of course, you will feel them immediately and it will be imperative. Yeah. Another, another thing also, you said that some, some models, can I mention cephalopods again, have a disability, but what about Aplysia? That can also have associative learning, right? So, yes. yeah. Aplysia has very limited associative learning. <laughs> Uh, it has associative learning. It can, lay, it can, by the way, learn also by very simple operant conditioning, instrumental conditioning, mm. not just, uh, not just uh, Pavlovian world learning. But it's very, very limited. What it cannot do is co uh, to uh, create the compounds and learn about the compounds. And uh, it does have second order learning, by the way. It does have it, arguably. Mm. Uh, but we wrote to, the, to Kandel and to people to ask about this, and it seems like yes, but only for very, very, very simple and non-composite kind of actions and pursuits. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we now have a little bit of time for panel discussion and, uh, and group discussion. I thought um, I might just kick things off by asking, I'm, I'm interested in criteria for uh, the ascription of consciousness. Ava talked about, I mean, it seems that a lot of your general attitudes and verdicts about the presence of consciousness in specific organisms depend on having some underlying general criteria for ascribing the presence or absence of consciousness. Ava talked about positive markers and negative markers. And in general, the focus here was on positive markers for consciousness, you know, kinds of behavior or kinds of processing which, when present, give you reason to think consciousness is present. But in this particular context, we can't, the issue in thinking about when consciousness first evolved, uh, we can't just be happy with positive markers, right? We also need negative markers, um, criteria for the absence of consciousness. I mean, everyone, I think, made some claims about where consciousness first comes in. Uh, Todd, very explicitly, this, this guy was the first. Um, Peter, claiming that, Peter saying that uh, consciousness arose a couple of times independently, maybe in octopuses and vertebrates, which suggests that the common ancestor, I guess some kind of worm, is, um, is, uh, is not conscious. Um, Andrew, very, uh, very explicitly in his claims that these unification mechanisms are necessary, and Ava, in that the capacity for associative learning is necessary. So I guess I'm interested in uh, being really explicit about what these negative markers are, these criteria for the, uh, these necessary conditions for consciousness, criteria for the absence of consciousness are, and what really are our reasons for believing that those things are necessary for consciousness. Stephen, in the, uh, in the previous talk, was saying, well, come on, consciousness is really simple. It's, uh, maybe it's just a matter of a simple ouch for a little subjective experience. Why do you need unification for that? Why do you need, uh, why do you need uh, associative learning? For that, why do you need um, you know flexible behavior for that? So I guess I'm curious to hear a what are, in your view, the the negative markers for consciousness? How do we know that they're criteria for the absence of consciousness, or is it simply an ab is it simply a lack of positive evidence for them being um, being markers of consciousness? Curious, to anyone can take that one. Um, I think that the way I view it since there are so many criteria for an absence, I mean, death is an, 
clear criteria for absence of consciousness. But I, I would say when we look at it, we think of the distinction between reflexive behaviors and non-reflexive behaviors. I think that's a re very reasonable starting point. I think that gets to the question of, well, if we can, if, if animals, if, if, an, if, if a con computer can do it, or if a zombie can do it, or if um, it can be done in the absence of consciousness by humans, therefore, you have to throw out the entire arguments that pretty much all four of us have made. And I don't accept those arguments because humans in the absence of consciousness do not do all of the things that we're talking about here. They cannot. We're highly dependent upon consciousness. Again, I think that you could probably generate a number of... Some aspects of consciousness are highly reflexive, right? Like pain. No, conscious pain is, is not highly reflective. It can be done. You can have a comatose patient who will withdraw to a, a, a thumb or, uh, you can, or a pinprick. Uh, you can have a, an, a, a patient with a spinal cord lesion who will withdraw to a noxious stimulus. So it's not necessary in the human model to have behaviors that would be conscious, were they conscious, okay? So, again, I think that the problem is we draw these, we argue about sort of minutia a little bit, and yet there's, but there's a much bigger obvious picture going on here. And I, I, um, and I would add that if you want to, one potential model is to look at the distinction between reflexive behaviors and non-reflexive. And I think, wouldn't you agree that that's sort of implicitly what you're looking at with the bees, for example, that you're, you're saying that this is too complex to be reflexes, or it's too complex to be just, and aren't you saying that with the, with the octopus, that this is not just a motor program running through. You're saying this is a non-reflexive behavior. Isn't okay, let's, uh, let's, let's move to somebody else. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just want to tell you about an experiment which is very interesting that was done with, by Swede, in Sweden in the 90s. In this experiment, what they did, they uh, tried to uh, condition people uh, they, uh, they, they gave them, uh, they presented them with a complex picture of sunflowers in a, in a field, you know, with a lot of patterns and things like that, but they masked it. People were not aware that they saw it, and then they gave them a little electric shock. And then they w wanted to see and, uh, whether the people have, been, uh, have learned this. They did also a control experiment. The control experiment was they, f they presented the people with something that they had been exposed to in the past, like angry faces, also masked it, and also gave them a, a little shock, to, and so, and, and looked to see whether they have been conditioned or not. The result was that the people who have been presented with the new and novel and unanticipated kind of landscape picture did not uh, become conditioned. The people who were presented with the face did become conditioned, although in both cases they reported absolutely no, uh, there is no, uh, there is, that they, they, they didn't see anything. So I think what we have to do is to look at this type of experiments. I'm not trying to build everything on one experiment, right? But it's a very telling experiment and we found it also only after we <laughs> developed this, which was very gratifying. Nevertheless, I think this, and what we want to see is, what can you not learn? What can you not, really, what can't you learn? What can't you get when you are not conscious? And this will tell us something about, uh, about this negative aspect. This is the only way that we can do it. And I think we, we can do experiments. And, and in fact, we're planning some experiments, simpler experiments than those done by the Swedish group, but similar in concept. To, to explore this, uh, this, this idea and to try and find out also, maybe we can do it also with, you know, in humans, we can do a lot of things we can't do with other animals, so. Yeah, yeah a bit about negative markers. So, right, it's, good, it's, a, it's a good question. I think what one will say about that is dependent upon the background of some sort of theory about what sort of thing consciousness is or subjective experience. I think the right, sort of 
bridging concepts in this area between mental and physical are the family of concepts around the idea of subjectivity. So uh, for that reason, I'd be looking for reasons to think that something isn't a subject. Now, I, I don't think I have a lot of detail worked out on that front, but here are two informative negative cases where I think you can sort of start to draw some rough lines. So among living things, uh, single-celled organisms have a certain kind of unity and they can sense and they can respond to what they sense. Um, and that's a kind of beginning, but they're very, very simple with respect to those properties. On the other side, a plant, like an ordinary tree, which some people do talk about more in this connection now than they used to, it's much more complicated, but it lacks uh, the kind of integration that an animal has, where the kind of integration that an animal has that's relevant, I think of, is pretty much entirely the consequence of the existence of a nervous system. A nervous system ties a body together in a way that a plant is not tied together as a body. So in the case of an animal with a nervous system and an animal with reasonable unity, uh, you have the requisite complexity and the requisite unity. In the case of a single cell organism, you don't have the requisite complexity. In the case of a plant, you don't have the requisite unity. So those are the sort of steps from which I'd be proceeding in answering your question. Did you want to come in on this? Andrew? Yeah, can I pick up? So to pick up on what Peter said about the need for basically subject and subjectivity and unity. I, I completely agree with that. And I want to sort of pick up on the, the ouch thing as well and possibly clarify that. Um, so for example, if we think about, so I think a bee it has a subject and it has subjectivity. If a bee experiences a noxious stimulus, every aspect of the bee's behavior is changed. It shows a change in affect. So it doesn't just change that it avoids the pain, but also it doesn't want to forage for a while. It devalues sugar rewards. It, you know, it, it, there is a complete change in the entire responses of the subject in response to a noxious stimulus. If we take a nervous system that I don't think is able to support either unity or subjectivity, like a box jellyfish, you can give that an ouch. You can hit a part of its body wall, and it will, that part of the body wall then changes how it fires that causes the whole organism to move away from the ouch. But if you silence just that part of the body wall that you gave the ouch to, it will go straight back towards where it was doing before. There is no unified subject that has experienced the ouch. It is localized to one part of the body wall, one part of the rhodopalium. That's very helpful. Thank you. I tried. <laughs> okay, we'll go to the uh, go to the audience now. Uh, over there. I'm sorry. Uh, oh. Thanks. You know, um, I mean, in some ways or another, it seems like what you're all up to is is uh, think, you know, trying to figure out which which species or or kinds of animals ha uh, are subjects of the life. And what what it and and what I, what I keep thinking of, which I'm curious about, is and historically we only assign consciousness to people, but now we're thinking about aspects of consciousness that extend beyond that. So then it has me thinking about the capacity for inner subjectivity, and um, you know inner subjectivity, the ability for two beings to share a subjective understanding, to sympathize with the other, to take the role of the other, or some aspect of that, is a thing that historically we've marked as something that only humans can do, but now. Um, there seems to be evidence of inner subjectivity between a animals of the same species that are non-human or perhaps even between across species. And so I'm, I'm curious about if there's that kind of mapping of the capacity for inner subjectivity and where some, the early, you know, where some people are thinking about where those lines get drawn or redrawn. I can say something very quick. Uh, one of the helpful features of the octopus is the fact that they break all sorts of rules with respect to things like this. They're a short-lived, mostly solitary animal with little interest in the internal states of other octopuses, except in very specific circumstances. Uh, but they have such richness and such uh, apparently uh, sort of subjectivity appropriate profiles of behavior. So when people lean very hard on the social character of the mind and extend that to the animal case, um, I like to wheel in my octopus. 
Yes, but the octopus has a lot of interactions with predators and prey. And this is also a sort. It's not interspecies interaction, but it is uh, it's not interspecies interaction, but it's interspecies interaction. So I think that the richness of interactions, social, it is a kind of social interactions. Well, we may not think about it like that, but it is. Uh, between predators, prey uh, is enormous in the octopus. They are very tasty. Everybody wants to eat them, and they are great predators. And uh, so I think this is a kind of, I, and I think, in fact, that maybe in some jumping spiders, the story is similar. They are also solitary, but they're great predators, and they're prey too. And when you have this kind of in, in very rich predator-prey interaction, I think this should be construed as social too. So we have the, and in fact, it is true that in vertebrate, vertebrates and are uh, not all of them, but many, certainly mammals, are very social by definition. Everybody has a mother. Uh, and m many of the social insects are social insects. And in fact, the, the social animals and also the octopus, the, the, uh, the, the mammals, the birds, which are inherently social, the social insects and the, and the octopus are not just able to do UAL, which is what I'm talking about. They are able to, they are already at a different level, already. They're at the level of what Dennett called paparian organisms. They have imagination. They can do, they have episodic-like memory. And I think this is to some extent related to the kind of very rich world of interactions which they inhabit. presented earlier, one of you, a triangle, which was desire, action, world. You've spoken, all four of you have spoken to a very limited degree about desire and where it arises in this process. And it seems to me that that's a major component of consciousness, but in, in general, the commentary has been silent on where that functionally might arise, or how it arises, or does it arise, and is it necessary to have consciousness that you have desires? Anyone want to take a question on desire? I, I think that in, my, in, in the model that I have presented, you cannot have the kind of learning that we're talking about. In fact, you cannot have any learning at all if you don't have a reinforcement system. You cannot, in, in the way that I'm thinking about it, you cannot think about target selection, learning about the world, about uh, learning about your own actions, about an action selection. You can't think ab about all these things without some kind of reinforcement system which provides the motivation. This is what uh, Bjorn Merker has been talking about. And the reinforcement system is absolutely crucial. All these things are tied together. I think you cannot think, in my, in my way of thinking, and here I... I'm, I'm, I do not agree with Todd Feinberg. I don't think you can think about affective consciousness separately from a perceptive, a perceptual consciousness. I think all these things, are, have, they, it's, a, it's a unified system, and it is, all these things have to happen together, including the motor representation. Of course, different animals will give different weight to different aspects of this uh, and, uh, and in different ways to this to these three components. But they have to be in place, all of them. That reminds me that I wanted to give people on the panel a chance to ask uh, questions to each other, in particular where there are, I think there are disagreements among, your, uh, among yourselves to, uh, to press on. So uh, you just mentioned one. Peter, do you have something you want to say? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I disagree a little with what Eva just said. So um, the idea that there's really a package deal here and that if you have the evaluative side you've got to have the sensory side and vice versa with respect to the bearing of these things on subjective experience. Um, I mean, it, it might be that way but I'm not seeing a, a reason to think it's that way and that's partly why I think it's helpful that we have those terrestrial arthropods who seem to be so sophisticated on the sensory side. They have to fly, for God's sake. Very difficult thing to do. You've got to have a very good handling of space 
and of the relationship between your own motions and the stream of input, all that kind of thing in order to fly. And that alone seems to be a reason to believe in something like sensory consciousness in these animals of the sort, for example, uh, that Todd talks about. And so far as I can see, that argument gets some purchase <coughs> even if these guys are evaluatively very, very simple. And because they have brains that are subject to natural selection for miniaturization, as Shelley Adamo has emphasized in this connection, I don't see any problem with the idea that you could have an animal that had a point of view in the richest possible sense of the term, the sort of sense that Thomas wants us to explain, but is evaluatively very sort of flat because it has no reason to have evaluative richness. To me, the separation looks very possible in, in principle. And maybe the other way. I mean, I'm very cautious about the other direction. And I think it's interesting that it's so easy to think of a sensorily rich and evaluatively weak animal and to look for real cases, but so difficult to look for and find evaluatively rich and sensorily weak animals. Uh, I just want to say that I find it amazing how much we agree. I mean, I was saying that it's like incredible. Sorry, I did a bad job. I did a bad job then. <laughs> no, but I, I can tell you that five or six years ago, uh, uh, you would get killed if you were talking about this stuff and arguing. And then it seems like we've all arrived at this pretty much the same conclusions. It's just of interest, I think. Anyone want to take issue with that? Well, I, I <laughs> obviously I disagree with. I, no, with this I don't. I'm going to use that one. I'm, I take issue with him. <laughs> I, and I think, of course, I mean, there will be, uh, if, if you have a very, very short-lived animal, that, yeah, yes, you will have, uh, you will have, and, you know, all it can do is, this is good, this is bad. I don't know what you mean by evaluative system. We're not talking about complex emotions, are we? Or, but, or, although we might in some animals. But the point is about the flexibility of this reinforcement system. How flexible is it? If they can do all kinds of very, very complex sensory discriminations, if they can move in the world and have spatial learning in a complex way, I mean, this has to be reinforced. They, they have to remember this kind of thing. Somehow, reinforcement has to come into play. So I think that, especially if you think about it evolutionarily, maybe after that, yes, you shorten the life so much that you hardly need to learn at all. But evolutionarily, I don't see how you can get there without, uh, without a, a, a kind of evaluative, uh, an evaluative system. We need Andy to weigh in on this. You know more about reward systems and invertebrates than, yeah. than most. People. Yeah, so what I'm trying to do is trying to disentangle two concepts, which is a reinforcement system and an affect system. And I don't see them necessarily being the, it's the same being yeah. the same thing, That's in true. that a reinforcement system, I think, can be phenomenally old and also very, very simple. But I don't see that naively equating to a system of affect. Um, so does that, I think that's, as far, that's, that's why I'm being quite quiet at the moment, because I'm not, I think that we may be talking about slightly well, different things. Yeah. When, when you look at an animal like, for example, a dragonfly or a wasp with very difficult sensory motor capacities, but I don't know much about dragonflies, but I think a rather regimented life. Do you see an animal that has all the point of view stuff that is evaluatively kind of flat, or do you not, do you not see that? Is it, what your, what's your hunch as someone who works on these sorts of animals? So there's this remarkable little work on the learning capacities of dragonflies, but the hunch would be that they certainly have the similar sorts of capacities that I would expect for a fruit fly. Mm -hmm. um, but the learning capacities do vary in insects in interesting ways. So some of the work that I have been doing, which is probably related to this, is that one of the famous papers in honeybees is that bees can learn abstract concepts. And we've been looking at neurally how that might be plausible in a nervous system like a bee. And we've recognized that there needs to be a feedback pathway that is developed in a bee but is not developed in something like a fruit fly. So a honeybee might be able to have that sort of capacity for a limited form of abstract concept learning. I'd expect that to be not so well developed for a fruit yes. fly. Um, I think I'm now sort of rambling. But what I'm trying <laughs> to get to is that the neat thing about insects is that we do actually have systems where we can try and relate capacities to nervous structures. 
and then possibly even test those hypotheses. Okay, maybe we've got time for a uh, question here. More. Um, what do you got, Henry? Yeah. Um, yeah, this actually uh, delves into my question as well, uh, Andrew. I'm trying to figure out what you're talking about with uh, your, your honeybees. Um, I, you know, um, what's important is um, understanding necessary and sufficient criteria for consciousness. I think uh, you need to solve the binding problem. Number one, necessary but not sufficient, and the other one is selective attention. So, in terms of you know humans and vertebrates, you know, I, I think you need a cortical thalamic loop. Uh, with insects, you don't have a cortex, you don't have a thalamus, but yet you're saying that they have you, you kind of bound things together and they have selective attention. Therefore, maybe you have what's necessary but not sufficient for awareness. I don't know. I mean, my wife works with Drosophila, and she thinks that it's something to be a Drosophila, which may be true, but. I guess what you're saying is you don't have to have those structures, but if you have something analogous in an insect or a different substrate, then you can have the beginnings of uh, so, something that can create consciousness. But so, you haven't proven that it's actually conscious or has anything it's like to be that be. So first of all, yes, I agree with your wife. Um, I agree with her too. Second, <laughs> yes, I think you've got my main point. I'm talking about basically a functional analogy. So yes, there is no cortex, there is no corticothalamic loop or anything like that in the insect brain. There are certainly evidence-based neural signatures for selective attention of processing and things like that. It's functional analogy I'm talking about, not anatomical homology. Um, and I've forgotten what the third point I was trying to make there. What was your last point? Um, and do you think that... Um Certain oh, have insects. I proven it? Have I proven consciousness <laughs> insects? No, I would agree with you. I haven't proven it. Right. But I've said that I don't think that we should rule out the possibility yeah. just because their nervous system looks different to us. Bees are more, more likely to be conscious than Drosophila? No, I think that they both have the capacity for the most basic form of awareness, but the contents of their consciousness will be radically different. Okay. Turn three. Uh, thank you. This question is, I think, mainly for Andrew. Um, I'm just very interested in this idea of bees and whether you mentioned that they, you think they do have affective experience. And I was wondering when you said a bit, you suggested that, you know, it's not just that when it, when it, it um, has experiences a noxious stimulus, one of the signs is it then, you know, it loses its interest, at least from an, it, it appears in sugar and that sort of thing. I was just, I'm curious to hear more about. I mean, this relates to Peter Godfrey Smith's um, sort of the sensory versus the evaluative side of experience. And, and like, if we're trying to think about the bee, I'm finding it plausible <coughs> that it might have sensory experience. But this idea of, uh, but it seems easy to imagine that its evaluative experience is flat or even maybe non-existent. I wonder about that. And so, in a way, why you might think that it experiences a noxious stimulus. Um, and yeah, it stops drinking sugar or going after sugar for a while, but why not think that's sort of just the purely causal result of the noxious stimulus? Like why think there's, you know, a, that the world is presenting to it as good or bad or pleasant or unpleasant? Like what makes, makes you think, no, you're, it's, you're inclined to think it does have affect of a certain kind? Um, short answer is yes. Um, but the, the papers I want to point you to, there's work by two authors. First of all, the work by Geraldine Wright, who was looking at negative affect in insects and bees, um, using a noxious stimulus and then showing how it changed their evaluations of positive stimuli and, and basically inducing a negative cognitive bias in a whole range of behaviors following a noxious stimulus. More recently, work by a colleague of mine, um, Clint Perry, who had a paper looking at how basically called, called looking at emotion-like behavior in bumblebees. And there it was giving the bees a positive experience and then showing an induction of a positive cognitive bias to a whole range of stimuli, including being less worried or alarmed by a threat of a crab spider. So it was a whole wide-ranging suite of changes in behavior interpreted as a positive cognitive bias following a positive rewarding stimulus described as emotion-like behavior or described as positive affect. So those are two authors to follow up on. And also, Clint Perry has a review that has been accepted now, so I can talk about it coming out soon on in exactly this issue in Journal of Experimental Biology. Okay, and last one from Ned. Um, uh, so um, in humans, um, we uh, uh, humans can 
are capable of what is called covert attention, which is attention to something without moving your eyes. So that shows a, an attention system that is independent of eye movement. I'm wondering if insects can do that. That's to me, I take it. OK. Yeah. So this is actually really interesting because mo a lot of insects, so Drosophila particularly, have almost 360 division, 360 degree vision period. Um, they do do saccades to move things into the frontal period of view. But that work I was talking about with the fan-shaped body. So basically, they can see all objects in their panoramic field of view all the time. The fan-shaped body has a capacity to then rotate the center of neurally, the neural signature of selective attention rotates within the fan-shaped body to fixate on the thing that the organism needs to pay attention to. That triggers the fly to saccade and reorient towards it. So that's a movement of selective attention that's preceding and causing the head movement and the eye movement. Does that answer and your question? Yes, it does. And okay. what are the effects of that uh, selective attention other than the refocusing of the eyes. So the, the effects of selective attention are, it, it is the neural signature that predates what the animal is about to focus on. So we see that window shifting their attention to what they're going to focus on as a neural signature, then their behavior changes and they reorient towards it. But does it change the actual uh, perception? So in humans, so, uh, um, when you attend to something uh, without moving your eyes, you uh, increase the um, represented level of contrast in the visual system. Uh, does that happen in um, insects? This is where we're pushing the level of available evidence and my knowledge of it. So I don't want to basically go beyond what I can talk about here. I bet you the answer is yes. We'll go with that for now. <laughs> um, the fact that Ned has the mic, or had it, uh, <laughs> Uh, makes me want to ask a question to Ned. So uh, <laughs> Ned asked a question to Andy uh, uh, where Andy had said, here's some things bees can do. And Ned said, well, we know that people can do all that stuff unconsciously. So why is all this stuff telling us something about consciousness? A Andy's reply was, look, I didn't put them up as criteria for consciousness. This was just to make you think that bees are not sort of uh, insignificant robots after all. But the way that Ned asked his question made me curious. So part of my talk was designed to sort of head off a certain objection I thought you might make at some point in proceedings, which is a relative at least, at least of the one that you made to Andy. So it's true, and I associate this with sort of the sorts of work that you're involved in, interested in NYU-ish work in some ways, where you try to get a, as long a list as possible of the sorts of things that people can do unconsciously. And I think of this as, as yet a tacit argument, although maybe it's explicit, maybe you or others have made the argument explicitly. A person might say, well, here's our list of things people can do unconsciously. It's a pretty good list of animal capacities. So why shouldn't we infer that to be an animal um, doesn't require consciousness of any kind? because all you have to do is do all these things, and all these things we know in humans can be done unconsciously. So I wanted to sort of, one part of my talk was designed to sort of head that off, or at least confront it ahead of time, by saying uh, there wouldn't be a direct argument of that form, because in the experiments that we're talking about here, the people are always conscious, just of, conscious of something else, as all this stuff is going on. So there's no argument yet that, uh, Sort of doing what's involved in being an awake, acting person, uh, there's no argument that you can be that without being conscious of something. And that makes me resist a kind of compositional argument where you sort of take all those capacities that have been done unconsciously, put them together into an animal profile and say, here's my unconscious animal. So I'm trying to resist an argument I don't know if anyone's actually made in those terms. But I'm very curious as to whether you would endorse an argument of that form and whether that's part of what was in your mind when you were making your objection to Andy. Yeah. So yes, that was in my mind. And Andy gave pretty much the same answer that you just mm -hmm. gave, which is that these unconscious capacities that we can find in humans all are in the context of a conscious being 
um, that um, has other conscious capacity at the same time. So maybe a good place to focus actually in humans would be the dorsal visual system. Um, so, you know, we can do all the, the dorsal visual system seems to be a completely unconscious system. It can work much faster than the conscious ventral visual system. Um, you know, it, it can control movements that the, the conscious ventral system isn't even aware of. But of course, that all happens within the context of a, of a being that has that conscious ventral system. So, yeah, I'm, coming to, I'm sympathetic with that. I think it, it could be that the, uh, that the approach I was basically suggesting, I think you, you say correctly, um, uh, you know, we haven't shown consciousness in, in insects if, we, if there are things that they can do things that humans can do unconsciously. Maybe that isn't exactly right. Yeah, so I, I'm sympathetic to your response. Pass it back to Heather, who has something urgent to say. Just something to add to that. I really like that argument because I'm along the line with Ned and I'm really interested in the unconscious and everything that it can do. But when you look at these split brain patients, right, where they cut the corpus callosum, and in a, in a way you have these kind of two separate consciousnesses, let's say, in these two separate hemispheres. But the right hemisphere, we, we can't verbalize it. And, you know, as far as we know, there's not a lot of consciousness going on there, but yet it can do a lot of complex things when we give it specific tasks, right? So in that sense, you're having unconscious processes without consciousness. That's a good case. Why do we think there's not much consciousness going on? Maybe Todd. Yeah, to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> some would say because we can't verbalize it. I know Todd's going to argue that it is conscious, it's but it's, it's well, it's no. Negative. Okay, well, go on. Yeah, good. <laughs> That's, that doesn't make there, anybody who studies colosomy patients who recognizes that it's a separate conscious system. They just can't talk. I mean, ask Zaniger what he thinks. Yeah. As, as Sperry would have thought. I mean, that we all agree that, that there are two separate conscious systems that can operate independently. There's tons of data on that. It's not, it's not debatable. Okay, I think it's gotten to the point where we better wrap things up. So let's uh, thank our group for a fantastic session. Just, just before you go to lunch, we'll, we'll be gathered back here at 1.30. Uh, they've asked us to clear the place so no one can stay here during uh, lunch. You're welcome to uh, leave something to mark your seat if you like, but it's at your own risk. Uh, good luck with lunch. See you at 1.30. You know, really dramatic but they still have in common those special features. Like we found isomorphism, we found all these other systems. So